Thank you everyone for joining today's webinar on ramial woodchip for soil health. Our chair today is Ben Raskin. My name is Astrid Barrowman and I also work for the Soil Association. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to let you know about the control panel that we'll be using today. In order to avoid background noise interference, we've muted all delegates. To ask a question, you simply enter your question into the questions window that you can see before you. You can hide your control panel by clicking on the little orange arrow up there on the left hand side of the screen above the microphone button. The webinar is being recorded, so we'll certainly share the recording with you afterwards. And we'll now make a start. I'll hand over to you, Ben, to introduce yourself and our speakers and host today's webinar on Ramiel Woodchip for Soil Health. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Astrid. Yes, so welcome. Uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see so many people interested in wood chip. Uh, we've not only got our, our home team, we've got Eric who's got himself up at six o'clock in the morning over uh, in the States to, to talk to us and we've got delegates from Denmark and Australia uh, and lots more so uh, pretty exciting uh, and we've gathered a bunch of wood chip enthusiasts both from researcher side and from the farmer side so we're going to have a good mix of the science and the practical uh, I'm not going to steal their thunder by talking in detail about any of them but uh, just to say as a fellow wood chip obsessive I guess um, I'm in the process of writing a book on it I'm really excited to to hear what they've all got to say so just to give you a little introduction as to how it's going to run uh, broadly speaking, we've split it into two, uh, two separate sections. We're going to have the first half is going to be three presentations. So uh, Professor Christine Watson is going to give us a bit of a background into the science of that soil and wood chip interaction. Uh, Sally is then going to uh, feed back on the WOOFS trial. And this seminar is, is funded by the WOOFS project. So she'll tell you more about that. Uh, and then Eric's going to talk about a different trial that he ran uh, over at Ananda Valley Farm. There's then going to be a very short break. Uh, if there's time, we've got a tiny little three minute film we're going to try and show during that break. Uh, if we don't have time, we'll show it at the end or, or send it around afterwards. Uh, but that's just a chance just to sort of stand up, stretch your legs, switch your brain off for a bit. Uh, and then the second hour, we'll uh, call those previous three uh, speakers back. Uh, and we'll also then welcome Ian Tolhurst and Robert Benford, who have been uh, two of the trialists in the WOOFS trial. Uh, and it'll be more like a, a panel session to talk about the practicalities of uh, and the benefits of using wood chips. So that's how the session's going to run. Uh, we've also got uh, Dominic Amos, who uh, is going to act as a moderator. He's another one of the researchers at the Organic Research Centre, and he's going to be attempting to uh, answer some of the questions uh, on the on the text as they come in. So if you've got uh, some uh, some questions, uh, do keep them coming in, and some of them we can feed through to the panelists. Uh, but if we don't have time to answer all of them, because uh, we do have uh, a lot of people attending so we might not get a chance to answer all the questions but um, Dominic and some of the others will try and answer them uh, by text as well on the question function so do keep them coming in. So uh, Christine Watson is Professor of Agricultural Systems at SRUC, uh, she's a guest professor at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences uh, and she has a background in soil science with a particular interest in nutrient management. Uh, she's also a trustee of the Organic Research Centre. So that looks as though we've managed to switch over to your presentation, Christine, so over to you. Thanks, you can see the presentation, can you back? So I'm trying to get rid of the um, menu. Maybe you can't see the menu. Um, Thanks very much. Anyway, um, I'm going to try and give you a quick introduction to uh, the science of soil and wood chip interactions. Um, it's very hard to know who's out there or what they know about soils or wood chips. So there's some simple stuff and there's some complicated stuff, but hopefully there's, uh, there's something in this uh, for everyone. Um, as, as Ben's already said, we've got lots of people around here who are, who are passionate about wood chips, but there's lots of us around the uh, around the screen who are very passionate about soils as well. 
um, I think a good place to start is remembering the sort of basic things that we need to understand about soils and that we need to think about their chemistry, their physics and their biology. And I think a lot of years ago, uh, people were obsessed by soil chemistry because that was the bit of it that they understood. They understood the bit about adding nutrients and the relationship with plant growth. And then in about the 1970s, people suddenly got interested in the, in the physics of soils and we have the Strutt Report and we have people suddenly being interested in compaction. And then over the last 20 years, probably, we've, we've got much more interested in soil biology. Um, and of course, you know, so, soil is, is a living organism. It, it isn't just physics and chemistry, it's biology. But we need to provide the habitats and the right chemistry and physics for that biology to, to succeed and for that biology itself to then uh, modify the physics and the chemistry. So very much thinking about the idea of if you build it, they will come. But we're all, I think, quite familiar with the idea that we can think about what goes on above the ground as a habitat. It's a habitat for biodiversity uh, and whether that's um, microbial biodiversity or whether it's plant species or whether it's uh, birds or pollinators. We're very familiar with that idea that above ground we have, we have habitat. But of course we have habitats below ground and this lovely illustration that I've stolen from Cotswold Seeds uh, just illustrates some of that idea that below the ground we're creating habitats, we're creating structures, we're creating pore spaces, we're allowing water to flow and all that is part of that whole idea of the soil as, as a living organism and of the different things that can live within that soil. So if we think about adding uh, wood chip to soil, then we need to think about how that changes what goes on on the surface of the soil and below the ground and what implications that has for those different physics and chemistry processes as well as earth biology. Um, and I, I've kind of got a series of cogs here because they're all interactive and, and it doesn't really matter which one you start with. So if we think what we might do when we add wood chips to soil, well, we're going to influence the, the, the physics. We're going to change the potentially the, the, the porosity, so the way in which water and air can flow through soils. The water holding capacity of the soil, which is really important that soils hold water under dry conditions, but let it drain under wet conditions. We can change the bulk density. We we'll change surface areas by putting all that wood chip into the system. We create surface areas that are habitats in themselves. And of course, putting, putting wood chip on a soil surface will also reduce erosion. If we think about the, the, the chemical aspects, well, pH is hugely, hugely important. I'm going to come back to pH. Um, macronutrients, micronutrients, the idea that we're going to shift the ratio of carbon to nitrogen by adding wood chip. Now, I'm going to get, I'm going to come back to carbon and nitrogen because that's a, a really important ratio in terms of whether nitrogen that goes into the system gets locked up or becomes available. And wood chip will also add carbon in both short and long term forms. So there will be some soluble forms of carbon uh, available, particularly in, in, in rainwater wood chip where you've got leaves there. Um, but there will be both short and long term available pools of carbon. And all these substrates for the biology. Uh, they can increase the micro microbial biomat, biomass, they increase enzyme activity, and of course they create habitat. So soil is an incredibly complex medium, and the, the diagram on the left is there to sort of illustrate just all the things that are going on in soil, and the fact that things that live in soil, some of them live in the kind of bulk soil, and some of them live around the, 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 the roots of plants. But if you look at the diagram on the right, this is a recent, uh, a recent review that was, was published in Nature uh, Microbiology Review, and it shows the impact of different things on soil bacterial communities. And the darker the colour and the further to the right, the more important those are. So look how important soil pH is. Look how important uh, changing organic carbon quality and quantity is, and oxygen concentration, all things that wood chips going to influence. It also influence moisture availability, nitrogen and phosphorus availability, and even at the lower end of things, temperature will, will affect bacterial communities. And of course, potentially putting, putting wood chip into soil can change temperatures as well. So lots of different things here that are influencing bacterial communities. But when we come to wood, 
fungi are extremely important in terms of decomposing wood. And uh, of course, not all fungi are equal. Some fungi are better decomposers than others. And recent work is starting to show that fast growing, more competitive fungi um, actually decompose wood more quickly than the slower growing and stress tolerant fungi. And what the little diagram shows uh, is we've got a relationship between the decomposition rate of wood and the rate at which fungal hyphae extend. So that the colored blobs represent temperature. So the red one is the warmest temperature, the blue one is the lowest temperature. And you can see that even at the three, uh, the, the, the blue, the, the, the orange and the red, or yellow and red, um, the set of blobs, in all of them, you've got that quite a strong relationship that as the hyphal extension rate grow, increases, so the faster the fungi are growing, the faster decomposition is able to take place. So all these things are kind of helping us to understand decomposition of wood in soil. And ultimately, eventually, may, may allow us to be able to predict what happens when you add certain materials. But if we think about it more specifically about wood chip decay, what might actually limit wood chip decay? Well, obviously, temperature and, and water will limit it. But also, where do those fungal, where do those fungi come from that are go, going to decompose that material? Well, some of them are going to come in on the, on the material itself, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the radial wood chip. Spores will also be brought in by fauna, whether that's earthworms or, 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 or bigger things. Um, airborne spores will also be a source of fungi. And the hyphae coming from the soil underneath will also be really important. And also that fertility of that existing soil is going to make a difference to the rate at which the, uh, the wood chip becomes incorporated into soil. So in a situation where you've got a lot of nitrogen, most litter is going to decompose. But where there's an, 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 in a, a nitrogen limited situation, then where you have a material with a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, the very woody material, that decomposition is going to be limited. And as a rule of thumb, uh, above uh, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30 to 1, stuff doesn't decompose. Below 20, it does. And I'm going to come back to that. I just wanted to show you some very recent uh, results. Um, thinking about how important pH is in terms of microbial communities. And this isn't about wood chip, but I think there are, there are interesting lessons here. This is a, some work that's been done, funded by AHDB and BBRO, looking at soil communities in a, a, a pH trial in soil. It's, this was started actually in 1961, and so for, for 50 years, we've maintained uh, soils at different pHs from 4.5 to 7.5 through chemical addition. But to actually, that's actually, I mean, we've got 60 years of, of, of crop growth showing just the impact of pH on, on eight different crops. But also, we've started now to look at the soil microbial communities. Um, and the little figures, one is bacteria and one is fungi. They don't show all the pHs, but what we've done is shown the bottom and the top. And then, so four and a half and seven and a half. And then six and 6.5 are the most common pHs, so we've left them in. And I think you'll agree that when you look at those diagrams, four and a half is very, very different from the other three. The colors basically show you different DNA in there. And so at the very low pH at four and a half, you're seeing less different colors than you are at higher pHs. But you're also starting to see, I don't know if you can, uh, you can probably see my pointer, um, you, you start to see some slight differences even between six and seven and a half in those compositions. So in the fungi, you see that different, uh, the orange the top is different. And in the, in the bacteria one, you see the different ratio of sort of that pink and blue at the top as you go across from six to seven and a half. So we're starting to understand what's in the soil and also what it does. I haven't got all the answers yet, but things are moving. Um, I thought I would just now just show you very quickly um, some uh, results from work done on wood chip in, in various parts of the world. And this is a study where they looked at carabid abundance under different uh, sorts of, of mulch. Um, and uh, you can see uh, 42 different species uh, under a number of different mulches. So there's the rainbow chipped wood, um, a plastic sheet as a comparison, and then miscanthus, dead leaves, and wheat straw. Don't worry about the stuff on the right, that's all to do with fly ash. But what's interesting is the, the species abundance. 
and how high they are um, under the rain mule chipped wood, very similar to dead leaves, slightly higher than, than, than wheat straw, um, and also the, the species richness in variety. So the idea that this is uh, providing a, a habitat for invertebrates. Um, many more interesting things to, to, to look at in that data, but we don't have time today. I'm also just going to show you one other complicated table, um, which where people have looked at soil biological responses to different ground covers. Um, and here I, I've highlighted in, in pink two lines. We've got we've got a brassica, uh, a brassica meal as a cover, and uh, we've, we've got wood chips as a cover. Um, and uh, you can see they both they both quite strongly influence the number of earthworms per meter squared. In terms of the infection of our vascular mycorrhizal fungi, as you would expect, wood chip showing rather more than brassica because brassicas and mycorrhizal fungi don't our vascular mycorrhizal fungi don't really get on. The third column is uh, substrate induced respiration, and you'll notice there's no, there's no difference here. Um, and in fact. No, no differences between wood chip uh, and, and, and a bare ground. And that's quite an interesting one in terms of thinking about how we measure changes, because it may be that substrate induced respiration, you, you add a substrate to soil and you see, uh, you see the response. And the fact that there's no, no response from the wood chip may simply be that the kind of fungi that are decomposing that wood chip don't actually uh, respond to that particular substrate. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we've also over here got uh, microbial uh, biomass in terms of grams of carbon per kilogram of soil, and uh, you see there the, 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 the wood chip having, having a big effect. So coming towards the end, because I think I'm running out of time then, uh, I just want to mention the idea that you know going forward we should, we, we're starting to understand very much more about soil biology, about how to control decomposition, how to add things to soil to get a particular function to happen. Um, and I just wanted to end with the idea that diversity is, is always a good thing, in, or almost always a good thing. Uh, how can we think about mixtures? How can we think about mixing wood chip with other things to give us the results that we want? Um, and down here, going back to this idea of carbon to nitrogen, very uh, small ratios down with sort of clover and legume seeds and things like vinasse. Up at the other end, we've got straw and leaves and sawdust. Um, and across at the, at the low end, uh, we see sort of mineralization taking place. At the high end, we see locking up of nitrogen. And the idea that we can mix a set of common materials with different kinds of carbon to nitrogen ratio really, I think, takes us forward in terms of thinking about how we might use wood chip going forward. There are lots of different things we can do when we add residues to soil. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but really just uh, thinking about what we've talked about uh, already. We can manipulate what goes in, the species, how we manage it, the quantities. All those will have an impact on soil fertility. Uh, and we're starting to be able to look at indicators for that. And I think this is going to come out when we, when we pass over to Sally. You'll see uh, some of these indicators uh, of the, the, the biology. Um, and, and, and chemistry, uh, what's going on with, as a result of the, the, uh, the addition of the wood chip into soil. I couldn't really uh, sort of end this presentation without, without including this photograph, which is, uh, which, which is Tolly <coughs> with a group of our, our students uh, listening to um, our wood chip enthusiasts. And you can see there the absolute fascination of a group of our master's students in organic farming just lapping up every word he says about wood chip and I think that really just sets us off for the afternoon. We're all part of soil management, we're important as well as the soil itself and we have to look at the ways in which we interact and in which we manage soils and wood chip to actually be able to, uh, to optimise the ecosystems that we're working in. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Christine. That was a perfect setting up of the uh, of the subject. And yeah, with that, I've got a few photos of groups of people being enthused by Tolly on his on his heap as well. <laughs> uh, so we're going to move on to Sally.
Sally works within the Organic Research Centre's agroforestry team uh, on a range of projects and I've worked with her on a number of those. She also is the secretary of the Farm Woodland Forum, uh, which if you're interested in agroforestry stuff is well worth joining uh, and a member of the Hedgelink Committee um, and has been involved in a number of agroforestry projects, too many to mention. Uh, so I will hand you over to Sally to introduce the WUFS project and the trials that she's been doing. Thanks, Sally. Okay, brilliant. Um, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so as Ben said, I'm Sally Westway, I um, work at the Organic Research Centre, and um, we've been leading on the WUFS trial. And WUFS stands for Wood Chip for, for, um, wood chip for Fertile Soils. Um, it wasn't a, a name that we intended to stick with, but we ended up sticking with it. Um, so it's a three-year project, and it's just coming to the end now. Um, it's been funded by the European Union, it's an operational group with nine members including farmers, foresters and researchers. And the aim of the project is to increase the sustainability of farm systems by linking tree and hedge management with soil improvement um, through the use of wood chip. So we had um, three specific objectives when we started the project. The first one was to determine whether applying wood chip, composted and uncomposted, is beneficial to soil health. Um, and then if it was to identify practical methods of wood chip production from hedgerows um, and other on-farm sources and look at methods to apply it to the soil. And then finally, to produce a set of guidelines um, based on our findings and also other research. So I thought I'd start by what is Ramia wood chip? Um, it's a particular type of wood chip and it's made from the smaller diameter material. So it's made from the twigs and the branches um, and it's got a higher um, proportion of um, bark and buds to the core wood um, is chipped when the leaves are off, um, so in winter, and then um, chipped um, fresh, so before it dries out, and applied fresh to the soil. Um, so there's been some previous research in Canada and the US and also in the tropics, which showed some positive results in terms of soil biology, soil, activity, uh, soil organic matter, and, um, and also yields and, and plant health. But there hasn't been much research or practical guidelines in an EU context, or at least in English language anyway. Um, so we set out to, to, to address this. We set up three trials um, on three different farms. The first is Wakelands Agroforestry over in Suffolk, um, where they've got ag an agroforestry system with an organic arable rotation um, in between the rows of trees. And we use wood chip here from, so Ramia wood chip from three different sources, from the willow short rotation coppice, from the hazel and from the poplar short rotation coppice. And we compared that against Ramia wood chip from mixed hedgerow and a control of nothing. Uh, we also looked at two different rates here. So we looked at a high application rate and a low application rate. Second site was Tollhurst Organics. So this is Tolly um, and he's on a farm near Reading. It's an organic um, vegetable farm and he uses wood chip compost as Christine mentioned in her presentation. Um, and we looked here at comparing his wood chip compost against Ramia wood chip from hedgerows and from other trees on his farm. Um, and then third was Down Farm, um, so conventional arable farm uh, in Hampshire. And he's got a green waste composting um, uh, operation on his farm. And we looked at comparing the green waste compost against, again, Ramia wood chip from hedgerows around his farm. And I think hopefully you'll hear a bit more from Tolly and from Robert from Down Farm later. Um, so first I was going to go very quickly through some of the logistics and costs. Um, so if you want Ramia wood chip, you've got to think about where you're going to get it from. So these are a couple of photographs from Tolly's. Um, this is the willow um, copse that in the corner of one of his fields, and he manages this on a seven year rotation for firewood. Um, and we looked at using the brash from this and um, chipping it for Ramia wood chip production. And then the bottom photograph is a boundary hedge, again at Tolly's, which we um, coppiced. It was about nine years growth, so some younger material, leaving some trees in, in situ. And again, this was chipped for use in one of the trials. So this is uh, Wakelands Agroforestry. And our trial, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but our trial was um, in the brown field in the middle. And you can see the rows of short rotation coppice here. So we looked at using the short rotation coppice willow, poplar um, and hazel as well. And we've got quite a good idea of um, Product, production levels from here because we've been doing research on this farm for a number of years now. So those are summarised at the bottom there and they're managed on different rotation lengths but the actual um, production per year is quite similar between the two different um, tree species. So this slide um, 
shows um, a sort of summary of how much you'd need of each different um, woody element if you wanted to produce 60 cubic metres of Ramia wood chip to treat a hectare of land. So we've got um, sort of 470 metres of hedge, 546 of hazel short rotation coppice, uh, more of the willow, but it's managed on a shorter rotation, or 52 um, trees uh, planted at a two metre spacing. So this is just to produce it for one year, and if you wanted to apply it maybe one year in five or one year in 10, you'd have to consider that in your rotation as well and, your, and how it would fit with your cropping as well. So we looked at spreading the material and the three farms are on quite different scales. So the top photo is from Robert Benford's farm, Down Farm, um, the arable farm, and this is uh, the machine that he contracts in to do his green waste um, compost spreading. It's I think usually norm normally used for slurry spreading, but it seemed to spread the wood chip quite nicely. Um, and then bottom, this is Tollhurst Organics. Um, so it's, this is just a muck spreader. Um, the material is chipped straight into the muck spreader and then put straight out in the field, so very fresh. And the photograph, if you can see it, is the, um, the chip on the ground. So it gives you an idea of the, the sort of application, the amount that we're putting on. And I think that was the 40 cubic meters per hectare. And then on the left of the screen is Wakelands. And here they, they attach this metal box onto the back of the muck spreader in order to make sure that the wood chip was accurately applied. Um, so it was applied to the specific areas that we wanted. Uh, so this table, it's got a lot of detail in it, and um, we have got some technical guides, which I think you can download from your the handout section of the webinar, if you can see that, um, where this table's in there, so you can read it at your leisure. But the sort of key things I wanted to point out were the costs for Ramia wood chip production and how variable it is. And this is depending on scale, but also depending on sort of availability of machinery on farm as well. And then again, the cost um, differential between green waste compost produced at a sort of larger scale and then wood chip compost such as Tolly's producing at a smaller scale and these are production costs only and there's quite a big um, variety between the two different um, costs there and that's based on the fact that the wood chip coming in on the smaller scale is from known um, people and it's of a higher quality whereas on a bigger scale you're getting more variety in and you're having to sort it and shred it and turn it. I'm sure Robert's got something to say on this but the costs are quite quite significantly different than each other. Um, so I've got a bit of time now just to talk quickly through the trial results and we will have a technical guide and a final report to go into more detail on these. So we have over three years um, collected a lot of data from the trials. Uh, we've collected data on soil nutrients, soil biology. Um, we've counted a lot of worms and where the trials went through to, to crops, we, we collected data on the yield and on um, pests and diseases and plant health as well. So firstly, the yields. Um, this, we collected data from Down Farm for two years for spring barley and at Tollhurst Organics on potatoes for two years and also some additional data on the brassicas there. So this is the potato yields at, um, at Tollhurst Organics. And if you look at the top graph, this is total yield. And you can see in 2019, so last year, we had a, a lower yield in the Ramia wood chip plots compared to the compost. Um, this year, it wasn't really much difference between them. Um, but then when you looked at, we graded the potatoes as well and looked at marketable yield. And if you look at the bottom graph, um, the marketable yield, you can see that the difference between them that we saw in, in the total yield is in 2019 isn't there. And then in 2020, you've got slightly lower on the compost, um, but not significant. But we wanted to sort of see why this was. And um, as well as recording marketable yield, we recorded the sort of reason we were grading out and the damage on the potatoes. And one of the biggest causes of um, grayed out was slugs. And this graph, I, I quite like this. It gives you, gives you a reason for that difference. And it's consistent across two years. So you can see that the Ramia wood chip is lower in the, um, the Ramia wood chip has lower slug damage than the um, compost and the control over both years. And this isn't really what I was expecting to find. And just listening to Christine, I was sort of thinking about reasons. And it might be actually that you've got more beneficial um, predators, so you've got more beetles that are feeding on the slug eggs. I guess I was expecting that the wood chip might create little habitats for the slug to lay their eggs behind or something. Uh, bottom graph shows that as slug, slug damage increases, marketable yield decreases. It's not, not rocket science. Um, so, well, in this year, while we were up there looking at the potato um, and monitoring the yield on the potatoes, we went up to look at the brassica field um, 
which was in potatoes last year, so which was in 2019 potatoes. And looking across the field, this is something Tolly pointed out to us, you could see these sort of bands of weaker growth um, and sort of pacing it out across, it looked like they tied in with the, um, with the treatments and the weaker growth being associated with the Ramia wood chip plots. Um, so we went back and did a, a little bit of further monitoring on this um, and measured harvest, uh, weight at harvest of Swedes, coal rabbi and white kale. It was quite a quick and dirty assessment, but there wasn't much significant came back apart from the, in the Swedes where the mass was higher in the ramiel um, than the compost, which again wasn't yes. necessarily what we expected. Oh, what was that? Which again wasn't what we expected with the um, with the uh, weak, weaker growth appearing to be in the ramiel plots um, and when they were younger plants. So looking for reasons, um, you've got, uh, we, we, we recorded um, downy mildew on the leaves as well as some other leaf diseases on the others. Um, and you can see here, there's um, significantly less downy mildew on the ramiel than the compost here. Um, so in spring barley, um, we've got the 2018 here, which was an incredibly dry year. Um, so the yields overall were quite low and they were down across the board. Um, and if you look across the control, it looked like it had lower yields though than the compost and the ramiel wood chip, possibly due to ramiel and compost increasing the water holding capacity of the soil. Then when you go down to 2019, um, the yields were back up again, but the, um, and no significant difference between treatments in trial one, which is two years after wood chip application. But trial two, which is one year after wood chip application, you've got a similar trend to um, trial one in 2018 with slightly lower yields in um, the control compared to the compost. So we also did a lot of soil analysis um, and I'm not going to go through it all now because we've got a lot of data, but it will be in the sort of final report and also in the technical guide as a summary of the key things. Um, this table here has got some of our um, key findings and I've, I've outlined in red the things I wanted to talk about. I suppose that the main headline is phosphorus, um, which was consistently high um, in the Ramy wood chip plots um, across all trials and all years. Um, K and MG, there wasn't much significant difference. Organic matter, um, you could see a difference um, only where we had the increased application rate at Wakelands. So where you've got the increased application rate, you saw an increase in the organic matter, but not much apart from that. Uh, the pH and CO2, so CO2 is a sort of measure of the respiration of the soil. So it gives a sort of crude measure of biological activity in the soil. And it's, it's a bit of a story tale of two stories here. At Tolhurst, you, you've got a reduction in the pH with the compost and the ramia wood chip. And this is consistent across all years as well. Um, and an increase in the CO2, so an increase in the soil biological activity. Um, but then at Wakelands, where we've increased the rate, you've got the reverse happening. Uh, we also looked at C2M ratios this year, so at the end of the trial, um, expecting to see um, higher C2M ratios in the ramiel, uh, but we didn't really see much significant differences between them, apart from at Down Farm, where there is lower um, C2M ratio in the ramiel, which is not quite what we expected. Oops, I think I just... Okay. Um, soil, bacteria, fungi and mycorrhiza. So we we've we monitored this over the years and between the trials as well. Um, the results are incredibly variable. It's very difficult to pick out trends. But they were variable between sites, between years, between trials, between replicates. Uh, but what we did see was an increase in the fruiting bodies of fungi um, across the on the ramia wood chip plots across all sites. So more mushrooms, basically. We also counted earthworms. Um, and the headline story here was there was high worm numbers at all sites, um, indicating that the soil at all of the three farms was very good. Um, in general, they increased over time at Wakelands and Tollies, where we had a lay in place for most of the trial. Um, and there wasn't really any significant differences seen between treatments. But we did see some differences between the ecotypes, so the type of worms that you're getting, and the species of worms that we had. So we did look to species in one year, and these are some of the different worms we found. This one's a green worm, which we found quite commonly in a lot of the plots. But this little graph here is just a sort of snapshot of the data to show that difference. And it's um, it's the worms at Tolhurst Organics in one trial in one year. But you can see that there's no difference um, between the total number, but when you dig into it a bit, 
the epigeics, which are the, the sort of surface dwelling litter eating worms, you had more of them in the ramiel um, and less of them in the endogeic. Uh, less, less of um, less endogeics in the ramiel. So endogeics are the soil living worms. Okay, final slide. Nearly on time. Sorry, Ben. Um, so the main conclusion is we had um, minimal or positive impacts on yields, and um, surprisingly, maybe no indication of nitrogen lockup. Um, but we did the trials were so the ramiel chip was was applied to um, legume lays at two of the sites um, with a mineral nitrogen application at the other site. Um, most soil parameters there was minimal effects of the ramiel wood chip, apart with the um, exception of P. So ramiel wood chip increased P availability. All farms had high organic matter initially, um, and it would be quite interesting to look at farms with less biologically active. Um, soils and try adding ramia wood chip to them because I think you might see more of an effect. Um, I think given the results of this trial it is a potential op option for farmers particularly where livestock scarce or raw materials for composting is unavailable and it's a nice way of integrating your trees and your hedges into your farming system so sort of bringing that fertility from the hedges and edges and taking it out into your fields into your cropping system. So we, yeah we've got some outputs um, have a look at the handouts this one here is available there and number two will be available soon, and I think we'll we'll send it round. Okay, thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you very much, Sally. That was fascinating. Right, to give you all your brains just kind of a, a minute, just to digest all of that before we uh, head over to Eric. I'm going to launch a little poll just to uh, ask you all where you're from. So it should pop up on your screen, and you can then click on it. And then we'll we'll see where you're all joining us from. You've all been very good and prompt. That's great. Still seven seven percent of you still to vote. Okay, I'm going to assume the other 6% are, uh, oh, no, 5% having a cup of tea. So, uh, let's share the results. There we go, that's where, where you're coming from. So, two-thirds from UK, uh, and then about a sixth from Europe, and a sixth from elsewhere. So, thank you all for that. So, I think that's hidden again. So, uh, Eric, we're so delighted that you have um, dragged yourself from your bed at this ungodly hour uh, to, to join us and share your experiences. Um, Eric is from Ananda Valley Farm, which piled uh, killing wood chips into vegetable fields as part of a California healthy soil program. Uh, for the last four years, Eric run the farming at Ananda Valley Farm in the park in the Bay in California. Uh, it's a small, mostly volunteer-run farm owned by the Ananda Spiritual Community. Uh, uh, he retired from a career in high technology where he ran business unit producing wireless radio. So that's uh, quite a change. So welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, just not if you can hear me. I just need to make sure it's okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. So yeah, we're um, here at Ananda Valley Farm, and we're just a small, you know, like I said, a, it's about a three-acre farm, and we do um, market farms, have done CSAs, and basically just one full-time employee, and myself, though, I'm just uh, a full-time volunteer. So, uh, next slide. Okay, so just, you know, why we, you know, why we decided to start trying to use wood chips on the farm. This is a slide that I did from my backyard garden. It was probably a decade ago. And, you know, just, you know, there was a lot of um, talk in, you know, in gardening circles about using wood chips and mulches. And one of the things they always said is never um, till the wood chips into the soil. And I thought, well, phooey, let's just try that and see what happens. And so I, um, I actually went out just with a shovel and I dug it a foot deep in a lot of the garden beds I had, and I put in 50% wood chips, you know, a shovel of, I 
put a shovel of um, soil and a shovel of wood chips in to fill the beds back in. And halfway through the season, you know, and I did to use a lot of um, nitrogen fertilizer too to overcome nitrogen tie up. And so the, halfway through the season, this was the first year I, I had done this, I decided to just dig around in the soil and see what was going on. And since I was, you know, manually mixing it, you know, it was not mixed very uniformly. And this one, you know, shows two clumps of dirt that were just four inches apart in the ground. It was close to a, a fruit tree. So the one that had all the wood chips in it, um, that's where all the roots went. And I was, to me, that was pretty amazing. And that just the clump that was right next to it, which, which didn't get a lot of wood chips mixed in, there were hardly any roots there. There were a lot of worms in the ground, and but more worms where the wood chips were. So I was thinking, wow, this is pretty interesting. Um, the roots really like wood chips here, and the worms like it. So, so yeah, that got me going on this. And then when I started to go then to Ananda Valley Farm, I thought, well, let's try it there. Uh, next slide. So when I started Ananda Valley Farm, you know, the state of California was um, offering you know grants for basically carbon sequestration, and so we we got a grant from that. And the thinking here was, is that, okay, what, you know, how much wood chips, fresh, raw, uncomposted, not even ramial wood chips, can I put in the ground and still get a good harvest the first year? You know, basically, you don't, you don't want to do harm to your farm, so let's try to overdo it and see, you know, what, what are the limits of, can you really overdo do it with wood chips? And so this was the, the first, um, yeah, let me check the time here. This was the first year. And we had a lot of different, I, you know, this is not a very scientific study. So, you know, basically just went on um, qualitative uh, observations. But, you know, on the left-hand side, we had a control where we used no wood chips. And then on the far right-hand side, we put in five inches of wood chips on the ground. And in the middle, we you know, had one inch, two inch. And they also did a, a row with, using eucalyptus um, chips, which is, I guess in here, we have a lot of them in California and they're, they're toxic supposedly. So I wanted to see what happened there too. And also the other thing that was interesting that I did is the first half of each row, I used organic fertilizer. It's a 1300, mostly uh, feather meal with some blood meal mixed in. But the second half of the rows, I, I used a chemical fertilizer. You know, we are organic here, but I just thought, well, if you could, you know, very inexpensively and easily get your organic soil matter up by using, you know, a one-time application of chemical fertilizer, I should try it and see what happens. Okay, so next slide. So this is the um, heavy wood chip row in the first year after it looks after we tilled it in. Now I used about five inches because if I used any more then our tiller actually wouldn't mix it into the soil. So that was, I figured that, would, that was just a practical reason to limit the amount we'd put in. And okay, next slide. Nope, next. No. Okay, so this is the, um, this is those, those same rows about halfway through the season. And really, you know, we're able to get good harvest from all the rows this first year and the subsequent years. Now, with, with a few caveats. Now, the first caveat was, was very interesting and unexpected is we had a very cold spring that year. And most of the, you know, a lot of the plants in the heavy wood chip row died. So for some reason, the ones that had a lot of wood chips in it didn't, weren't able to sustain the cold very well. And they had to be replanted. And so you, now you see everything because we replanted everything after it got warm. And then the other thing that was really interesting is where I use a chemical fertilizer, virtually all the plants died in because of the cold weather. Now I just used a very little bit, so it wasn't I wasn't you know giving too much stuff, too much fertilizer to it. And you know, I can only speculate on that, not being a soil scientist, but you know, maybe the compost or whatever the microbial life allows it to withstand the um, cold better, and maybe the, the salts, you know, in you know got in the way of that. But it was really remarkable just, you know, you know, this I lost almost all of that in the chemical um, fertilization rows. You know, once I replanted, then they did OK, because we replanted when it was was warm out. Uh, the, the row that did the best with the cold was actually the one that had one about one inch or just a thin layer of wood chips, a single layer of wood chips on the ground. And the control row did very well, too. Now, the other um, caveat is that I did have to add a lot of fertilizer to the heavy wood chip row. 
and yeah, sorry, it's about, I used about 10 tablespoons, sorry, uh, about 1300 per plant. We do, you know, on this farm, we do, um, you know, site or uh, fertilization. We, you know, when we transplant, we put a, a scoop of fertilizer in every single transplant hole. And I just found that gives us much more consistent results and uses less fertilizer. So I did have to use about probably 3x the fertilizer on the heavy wood chip row that I would usually use on a control row that has that would have like one inch of compost mixed into the soil. Okay, next slide. Okay, this just shows um, you know you know getting the wood chips for us it's no problem. Um, we get there's a local tree company that we allow them to dump wood chips on an empty field that we have don't use and actually they pay us a hundred dollars a load to dump it so our cost of wood chips is um, negative <laughs> so that's kind of nice and um yeah we you know we were able to well we purchased the a manure spreader from the grant money it's very small if you're going to do this you want to get a big you really want a big spreader so that you don't have to make so many trips okay next um slide Okay, this just shows us spreading it and and on the right hand side that shows what the on the main fields you know we, we have the test rows and on the main fields what i would do is we would just put a layer of wood chips on in the fall and then just let the weeds grow all winter because you know it rains in the winter here and the, that's when a lot of things grow the weeds grow and just in in the, in the spring then we would just till it all in so they would sit on the ground for you know a few months before they were tilled in, but it was just it covers about half the half the field if you look at it with one wood chip deep. Okay, next slide. Okay, just to you know this is just a you know nice slide to to show that pretty much you know all the stuff you know that it you know this you know using the wood chips uh, you know it does work or you can get a good harvest from it. You know, I, I didn't actually see much of a difference between the initially between the rows that I use compost and the ones I use wood chips. The the results were about the same. Like I said, with the heavy wood chips, I had to use more nitrogen fertilizer, and I just kind of did that as we went along, looking at the plant growth. But yeah, all all of these um, vegetables you see here were grown in soil that had mostly had a thin layer of wood chips mixed in, and and one thing I might notice is that we do use it in the greenhouses where we use our it's cool it's cool where we where we are we're on the coast and but I do put in like two or three inches of wood chips into the greenhouse rows because that burns up the organic matter gets burned up faster there and so yeah tomatoes and cucumbers you know they love the the soil there and do very well okay uh next slide Okay, so this just, you know, <laughs> this is my little scientific, not quite as extensive as what you guys have done, but I just really focused on the soil organic matter. And since we were doing carbon sequestration was part of our, our what we were supposed to be doing, you know, so our soil, when we started off, you know, 2.9% organic matter, kind of low, it's, um, was it's crushed granite loam, and it's also on a, where we are, it's kind of on a hillside on a slope and we get a lot of rain in the winter so a lot of the you know finer particles get washed away so at the end of year one this was the, the most interesting one i thought in the control row we put in one inch of compost down and mixed it into the soil and then there's the one inch i just put the one inch there had actually a little bit less compost at the end of the year had a little bit less organic matter but the five inch wood chip row yeah it went from 2.9 to 7.2 percent organic matter in basically six months. And when I actually went to do the soil test in you know, November of 2018, at the end of the year, on the heavy wood chip, there were still wood chips on top of the soil in the heavy wood chip row. You know, I scraped all those away and got soil from down um, deeper, and there were no wood chips left in the soil. And all the ones that had been dug into the soil had been, had been totally decomposed, and which you know, for me was kind of amazing. So then, the second year, though, uh, was interesting is the actually the organic matter went down in all, in all three rows. And one is in the control row, I didn't put in, you know, I stopped putting in, this wasn't a very scientifically controlled study, and I just did things differently each year, but I didn't put any um, organic compost in the control row, just I wanted to compare, okay, yeah, not doing compost. And then 
in the other two rows though that had wood chips in it i only put in one line of broccoli because we produce more broccoli than we could sell so i thought well, let's just do one line so it means it doesn't rain here so we put in drip lines and so i only had one drip line in and we watered less so really those rows the second year got much less water and so when i went to dig them out to do the soil test at the end of the year there were still wood chips left in the ground in those and i picked all those out before i sent the soil in to be tested so i think that was the reason that the organic matter actually went down is that it didn't all fully decompose like the first year and of course tilling it burned up a lot of um, you know the idea is you know we do till here and i only try to till once a year just one time and that's it to, to minimize that and unfortunately i don't have the results from the third year um, we'll get them later this week and we'll post them on our website I have to do a little YouTube um, presentation of this for our grant. I would expect this year that the soil organic matter would go up a lot because just from looking at it, I've already sent in the samples and most of the wood chips had already decomposed because I went back to using two lines and letting some of the weeds grow in between the plants. Okay, next, next slide. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, one of the, you know, the, um, you know, motivations for doing this too is I really wanted to get rid of using compost. You know, compost is great and the plants love it, but it you know it just takes work to do it, and or, or you have to buy it, and it and it's a cost. So I, I was hoping that you know by spreading this wood chips in the in the fall and tilling it in, I could just use uh, nitrogen fertilizer and everything would just be the same and, and good. And for the first two years in the main beds, that's what I did, and it was okay. This last year though. Um, I noticed the plants weren't really, I was still getting harvests out of them, but they weren't as vibrant and they didn't seem to be doing as well as they should be. So I resorted then, you know, still not using, you know, spreading compost over the whole thing. What I did is, you know, we did the spot fertilization. I mixed the fertilizer in a one-to-one -one ratio with compost. And that's what we would use to fertilize um, the plants when we transplanted them. We put about a quarter cup of fertilizer quarter cup to a half a cup per plant as we um, transplant. And then the plants did great. You know, they were back to their normal healthy harvest and vi vibrancy. So using the wood chips didn't, you know, at this point didn't totally eliminate the need for compost for our farm, but it dr dramatically reduced it. And so, yeah, okay, next slide. And I, oh, that's the last slide, okay, yeah, okay. so. Yeah, and I was just interested, I'll just say, you know, in um, seeing some of Ian Tolhorst stuff where he mentioned that he was actually turning the wood chip piles and I was actually gonna try that to see if we can kind of make a, make a compost plus fertilizer mix for spot fertilization that would be useful in the future. But thank you. Great, thanks so much, Eric. That was, that was really interesting. And, and actually your last comment in a way echoes one question that came in from uh, Mark Orton, which was around, he actually, I mean, he asked it earlier, I think during Christine's presentation, but obviously there's echoes of it through all of those presentations about, uh, you know, actually because of that carbon nitrogen ratio in wood chip, it, are you better to compost it first? Uh, and he mentioned the Johnson Sioux bioreactor, for instance, and I've seen evidence particularly where you get greater diversity of fungi and other organisms where you you've used something like a bioreactor um and i you know just uh we can bring tolly in potentially but equally we'll i'm sure we'll have a fuller discussion of this after the break um but i guess christine initially do you have any thoughts on on the benefits potentially of composting or not composting it and uh, you know obviously there's a lot of factors uh, you know like for instance the water that you mentioned eric you know where it seemed to decompose much quicker when you were irrigating more but uh yeah christine you got any thoughts on that initially i think it's a million dollar question um in the sense of it depends well <laughs> i guess wood, wood chip is like um is, is, is like compost and like many other things it's the kind of rubbish in rubbish out what you get in will influence what you get out and what is it you want this material for? Uh, what is it you want it to add to the soil? And in, in some situations, you may actually want to use it for purposes where it's going to soak up water or soak up nitrogen uh, to prevent loss. Um, and so you might not want to compost it. Um, if you want it to make a quicker difference to the soil, then I would suggest that composting was a good thing. 
but I'm sure Tommy will have a much more sensible answer than mine. So let's leave that hanging, tantalising in, in the air, uh, because it's now 5-2, so I'm going to give you all a chance to stand up and stretch your legs. Do please start submitting questions, because the bulk of this second hour is going to be a QA. and a We're going to have just a very short uh, introduction to uh, Tolly and to Robert before we start, but most of it will be questions, so do start sending them in. Uh, and if you do want to hang around and watch this very short film, uh, it's it's not highly technical. It's slightly amusing, uh, but it is wood chip. Uh, and Sally, I believe you're going to try and play it. Is that right? Yep, I will try and get it up now. Excellent. We'll see you back in five minutes. And today we're going to be learning all about wood chip. I'm going to interview Ben Raskin, Head of Horticulture and Agroforestry at the Soil Association. We're going to find out how wood chip helps our soil, plants and our planet. What is wood chip? Wood chip is the material you get when you cut down a tree or you chop off all the branches. Uh, and you chip it all up really small, so you get lots of little bits of chopped up wood. How do you use wood chip in your garden? It's dead easy using wood chip in your garden. There's lots of ways you can do it. You can add it as a mulch, and that's a thin layer, or sometimes quite a thick layer, of wood chip, and it keeps weeds down to save you having to do a lot of weeding. Uh, and it also keeps water in the soil, so if it's really hot and dry, you don't have to water your plants as much. Uh, you can even add it if it's well rotted wood chip, you can sprinkle it on your soil and that helps feed the soil organisms. And there's one more way you can use it. You can even use it as a potting compost for your plants to put into pots. How does wood chip help fight pests and diseases if it does? In willow wood chip, there's a substance called salicylic acid, which is like the aspirin that we take for headaches. And that can actually stimulate uh, an immune reaction in plants that help it fight off pests and diseases. How does wood chip help the planet? Well, when trees grow, they take carbon uh, and hydrogen and oxygen, so they take a lot of carbon out of the air, and they use the power of sunlight to turn that into sugars. Uh, and, in, and that material, that, that organic material as it's called, that goes into the tree and into the soil. So it pulls carbon dioxide, which is one of the gases that uh, make climate change worse and they pull it out of the atmosphere and put it into the trees and into the soil and using wood chip you actually keep some of that carbon in the soil so it means you've got more carbon in the soil and less carbon in the air. Where can I get wood chip? Well wood chip is easy to get even if you haven't got trees in your garden there's tree surgeons that are cutting down trees all the time and they have lots of wood chip that they sometimes have to pay to get rid of. So if you go on the internet, you can look up the websites where you can log in and people are giving wood chip away for free. So that's how wood chip helps the soil, the plants and our planet. To find out more about organic and agroecological farming techniques, visit the Soil Association website. Thanks, Sally. As you can see, pimping out my children and the cause of wood chip. Right, we've got just a minute. I'll give people just a chance to filter back. We've got some good questions coming in. Start the future, Ben. <laughs> he thinks so, certainly.
Right, so it's uh, well three o'clock UK time. Uh, welcome back, everyone. So what I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask uh, Ian Tollhurst or Tolly, as he's known to everyone, and Robert, just to do a quick five-minute introduction to to sort of who they are and what they do, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. We've got, I think four or five good questions coming in already. So I don't think we're going to be short of discussion topics, uh, but all of our previous speakers will be uh, available uh, on the panel as well. So, uh, Robert, if I could start with you. Uh, I'm just uh, quickly going to find what I know about you. Uh, so you've been trading at Down Farm in Hampshire yep. in the UK. Uh, since 18, not you personally, but since 1895, Correct, uh, yes. you look, you're looking good for your age. Uh, <laughs> so it's currently fourth generation. It's a mixed farm of 160 acres, but I'll, I'll let you tell it in your own words is probably better. Yes, thank you. Um, it's 160 hectares, but what Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's a mixed farm. We uh, predominantly uh, entirely conventional arable farming. Uh, rotation of crops is uh, wheat, wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, um, and that just go, goes around and around. We uh, diversified about 15 years ago into uh, green waste, uh, green waste which we used to make compost and we spread all the compost we make on our own fields. So the fields have been getting anything up to 80 tonnes a hectare year after year. Um, of, uh, of, of green waste compost, and it certainly uh, made a noticeable difference. It, it's, it's noticeable rather than dramatic, is how I put it. Um, we got involved in, uh, as a sort of spin off from the spin off, we got involved in wood chip through a local cooperative in Hampshire, um, which is mainly woodland owners looking for a, a market for their um, otherwise unsellable wood. Um, and so we're now a hub of the Hampshire Wood Fuel Cooperative. Um, so we're quite heavily into uh, virgin wood chip, which the co-op markets to biomass boiler owners in the uh, general area. Um, and uh, we're also involved with waste wood, which is a complete digression today. So it's a very ordinary farm, basically, with small numbers of livestock and a larger arable operation. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so Tolly, uh, quick uh, quick intro to, to, to who you are, if you can make it quick. You've got so much to say, I know it'll be, it'll be hard to cover it all, but. Oh, we can't hear you. It says, it says that you're, Oh, we heard you briefly then, and then you cut out again. Sorry, Tolly, it's Astrid here. You just need to unmute yourself. Any joy? Let's go to one of the questions while we're waiting for uh, Tolly's audio to work. Uh, so there was a question uh, around, uh, so on allotment sites, the main source of wood chip is from tree surgeons, which means it will be a mix of conifer, hardwood, old and young wood and leaves, uh, and this will vary with the season. How should we be best be using this? Asked Pauline. Uh, who wants to kick off with that? Sally, do you want to have an initial go? Uh, yep, I can do. Um, can you just repeat the question? I was just answering another one in the chat. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's about the fact that when you get it from, uh, you know, tree surgeons, it's a whole range of mixture of stuff, olden woods, conifer, mm. broadleaf, uh, 
diff varies according okay. to the season. What's the best way of using it? Well, it sort of relates a little bit to the question I was just answering, actually, which was about differences in the SRC wood chip when you were putting it on. And the, the Worcester um, results suggested that there was quite a lot of variability in the chip. So we did some substrate analysis which had been present um, of the wood chip before we put it onto the, the field, sort of all the different types that we used. And there was a massive amount of variability in the, in the um, nutrient content of that. But then when you actually went through to, to what happened on the ground and in the trials, we didn't see that. So I'm not sure it makes a huge amount of difference. I'd be quite interested to hear Eric some bit about the um, eucalyptus, though, and whether that actually made in, oh. had any effect at all. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can just talk from my own experience. Yeah, because we get it from, I guess you call it tree surgeons, and we just get piles in our field. And the first year I used... Um, mostly just fresh wood chips because that's one to try. But now when I go out there, I just try to pick the pile that looks the best, you know, best degraded or composted one. And yeah, it, and I think just with a, a thin layer, I don't see any, you know, any much difference in the field. Um, so I think, you know, with a thin layer, it doesn't, um, the, there isn't a lot of variability. And then with the eucalyptus, um, putting fresh wood chips in the ground absolutely stunted the growth of the plants but i also did it we did another row where we had i used a eucalyptus mulch for a year on the ground in a, in a swiss chard um, row and then then we tilled in it was like about two three two to three inches of wood chips of of aged uh, eucalyptus and the plants did fine after that so so yeah so you so eucalyptus fresh really stunted it but eucalyptus that had been aged as a thin mulch on the ground um, after a year um, didn't do yeah didn't harm the plants at all and they did well yeah and i think that backs up some of the studies i've looked at with sort of looking at other allopathic chemicals in wood chip and it seems to be that after about six months or so most of them do seem to degrade uh Polly, it looks like we got sound from you yeah it looks like you've let me out at last yeah <laughs> You've, uh, you were, somebody there was muting me. Obviously, I don't, um, I don't know who that might be. Do uh, you want a very brief introduction from me? Is that right? That would be great. Thanks, Ty. Okay. Um, well, I've been doing wood chip in various forms for probably about 15 years or more now, and we, we use it in different ways. So we're using it on vegetable production. We have, um, in total, just under 20 acres of vegetable. Um, most of that is filled veg, but we also have permanent raised beds and no digging tunnels, plus we have outdoor land in the garden. Uh, we're very diverse. We grow over 100, and, or over 100 different types of vegetables, of which we have well, many, many varieties. We're producing around 120, 140 tonnes a year. We're on pretty mediocre land. It's not really good quality at all, although it's improved enormously in the last um, decade. So we're, we're using wood chip in two ways. We're using it for composting, and we're also using it as raw gramule wood chip. Now for composting, which is where we actually started, it's a mixed varieties of different trees, most of which is coming from local tree surgeon. So rather like Eric, we have somebody who comes and leaves it, although we don't get paid. Um, we're quite happy to have it for nothing. And we're composting that through a windrow process, um, which takes around 12 months in total. It means we can accept a wide range of different materials. So we can even take up to around 25, 30% maximum conifers, which can be difficult on their own. And because it's mixed up into windrows, we don't get any particular problems with you know, different types of wood, which some of which are not that suitable for composting. Now that material, some of that composted wood chip is used for plant raising, and that's where we've done a lot of work and uh, we've done trials. We did the Dutchie trials some years ago, which came up with some very interesting results. And we've, we've managed to produce a, a plant substrate, which is absolutely 100% ideal in most respects for plant raising. So we use a relatively small amount. We only really get through probably about seven, 10 cubic meters a year in that. The rest of it is going on to mostly onto our field crops. It goes on to green manure crops. Only we never ever put compost on bare soil. I, I think it's a terrible waste to put any organic material on bare soil. So it goes on to uh, the green manure part of the rotation where we have very high 
biological activity, plenty of earthworms. And if it's not completely composted, it's not a problem. We've never had any problems at all with denitrification. Moving on to rami or chipwood. This is something we've only really been trialing properly in the last sort of four to five years. And it's really instigated from, from again, research centre really wanted to do trials here. We're looking at using our, our own material. And we've had some really interesting results with that, and Sally's already presented <clears throat> some of that today. We're very keen to pursue it further because we, we see the advantage in, in not composting is primarily not having to do the work, not having to move materials. Um, however, it, we wouldn't stop composting completely. We would still be using some composted material, but we would prefer to be moving more towards granule chip wood. And it's looking as if that's probably where we're going to be going in the future. We're using our own wood at the moment. So we have, I think Sally already told you, we have hedges, we have coppice which has been, the coppice has been the easiest to manage because it's willow, produces a vast amount of material. Um, and we're looking at the farm really in terms of how self-sufficient we can be in the sense of allowing for complete carbon production on the farm itself and still grow vegetables. We are a stock-free farm. We don't use any animal inputs at all. We don't use any fertilizer. We haven't used any manures or fertilizers on this farm for 33 years. Um, we do use a lot of green manures, but we are really quite keen to encourage um, more ramu or chip wood because we can see there's some real benefits going on with our soil. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Tolly. So there's just a couple of bits that you mentioned that I want to pick up on that have also reflected in some of the questions. So one is around the timing of application so um, you mentioned that you don't put any on to bare soil um, and it would be perhaps interesting to hear sort of other people's views on that as well I know Eric you've obviously been trialing it on bare soil um, but also what sort of is there a time of year that is better or, or not and then the sort of follow-up or sort of slightly different question is really trying to unpick whether ramiel is better uh, you know is there a is there any rule of thumb or are there so many sort of variations around the system and the type of chip and all the rest of it? So if we maybe start with the timing question. Okay, so timing, we generally try to apply our composted wood chip, uh, which <clears throat> as I said, is, is, is only going on to green manures. We do it sometime between February and um, middle of September. We, we, we only do it during the growing season. The reason for that is twofold. One is we've got a really good ground cover, we've got good thick green manures which we can travel on without damaging the soil with heavy machinery and also the soil is much more active it's more vibrant it's, it's, it's more alive there's a lot of earthworm activity so any material is processed much more rapidly to do it during the winter is possible but only if the ground is frozen and we haven't had that for probably a decade we, we just have not had a period of frozen ground now for over 10 years so I'm very loath to go on to wet ground, so we don't do it really at all during the winter. Although I wouldn't be adverse to doing it during the winter, providing it was dry. I'm not worried about loss of nutrients, as I would be if I was using, say, animal manure, because that is a serious problem. In fact, our organic standards do not allow the use of animal manure applications during, during, during that time of the year. Um, the other part of your question was to do with why we don't put it on bare soil. Was that the one? No. Uh, it was more going on to the, the ramiel versus composted, oh, yeah. so maybe we'll just pause it and just see, right, Robert, have you got any thoughts on timing? <clears throat> We're mainly driven um, by the need to uh, sort of find a home for the compost. So what we tend to do is to have a big spread almost immediately prior to uh, establishing the crop. Okay, great. And Eric, what about you? What sort of drives the, the timing for you? Um, yeah, I've done it both. Um, in the fall, you know, we do it like at the end of the harvest, you know, before the rain starts. So we get on the ground before it gets too wet in the, in the winter time. But I've also done it, you know, just right before, right before plant, right before transplanting. So, um, yeah, I mean, doing it in the fall, obviously, I, you know, seems to have a better effect on the soil because it's already, you know, it's already started to degrade and decompose. And I guess the difference is you're also adding some fertilizer at the same time where where Tolly you're just putting on the wood chip. But. 
Um, yeah, we're relying on the wood chip. We're not really relying on the wood chip in terms of its NPK value, although it does have some. It's more really about the the the, the sort of fungal inoculation aspect and you know the increasing of soil microbes plus the carbon content we're looking at. Um, we, we're not. We don't really have a issue about NP and K. We're we're okay with that anyway. Um, I, there is a slight difference. I did, I did say we never put it on bare soil. It's not quite true. There are a couple of instances where we do apply composted wood chip to bare soil. One is in tunnels where we have a completely controlled environment. Uh, we're applying incredibly small amounts because we have very high P and K levels. We really don't want to push it up. We've also got very high organic matter levels. We don't want to push that any higher either because we're going to run into soil obesity. So we're actually putting on very modest amounts. Outdoors, we, we only ever apply composted material onto land where we're planting strawberries, onto bare soil. That's the only time. And the other time it goes on to, onto green manure crops only. Great, thank you. So in terms of the, you know, so there are a number of questions around whether rain mill is better than composted. So as an example, there's a question from uh, Kate McAvoy, which says, for Tolly and Robert, as a practical grower rather than researcher, if you were looking to use wood chip from brash from a mixed coppice as a fertility addition, which is quite specific, going on to a two year clover mix break in veg rotation, would you choose to use Romeo or composted? Uh, but there's other similar questions, uh, you know, about sort of whether, what, what the different benefits of uh, composting it or using it fresh are. Um, in the answer to Kate's question, I would say yes, I, I would use it, um, but it would only be going on to green manure. The thing about having green manure acts as a really good buffer. So if you do have material which is going to take a year or two to rot down, it actually rots down on the surface. And, and the completion of the process is really done through soil biology and, and earthworms. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy to say that ramen is better than composted wood chip because they're two the two quite different materials. The thing about composted wood chip, it allows you to have a range of different species which you can mix up, some of which on their own may not be suitable for ramuel. I'm thinking in terms of conifer in particular, which if you're dealing with tree surgeons, you're going to get conifer, you're going to get cupressors, they land eye, um, and you, know, you need to be able to compost that. That is completely unsuitable for ramuel wood chip. And Eric, I mean, you were initially you were saying you hoped almost sort of replace your compost use because that it was it was another thing that took time and was a hassle, um, but that you don't think it it was going to do that. Do you think that there's there's biology in that composted material that that you're missing out on, I guess, by using the fresh wood chip? Um, well, I, you know, the, the the second years I wasn't using fresh wood chips; I was using aged wood chips, and you know, I picked the ones that were most decomposed. I'll say the one the where I use the the heavy wood chips and till them in the soil. I don't you know using compost didn't make any difference. I did do some other things there. So, but just with a thin layer, I did need to use more compost, a little bit of compost to get the probably the microbial life going again. So I I do believe probably I'm going to try it this year if I till in like five inches in the fall and then in the springtime I probably wouldn't have to use compost. But laying that that amount of wood chips on the ground, you know takes a lot and it's it's a big effort versus just a thin layer um and yeah for rain meal versus the other one i you know i haven't yeah the rain meal obviously seems to work much faster and it's more like compost but and the but the other stuff i do kind of like too because it helps um lock the nitrogen in the soil over a longer period of time and yeah i'd, I'd add to that provided i had the right material i would prefer to use rain meal because i don't know if Sally pointed out, but where we did the trials here, the, the amount we're putting on in terms of composted wood chip and ram it was the same amount per square mm -hmm. meter. But what you have to remember is because we've been through a composting process, we're actually putting on twice as much. It's twice as much wood chip to make that compost. It goes down by 50%. So there's a handling cost there. There's also the potential loss of nutrient uh, through the composting process. So I would always prefer to use ram or chip wood if we had the right material, but we don't always have the right material. So composted wood chip is a is a really good runner up to that. And Robert, what about you? Yeah, I think uh, several things really. One is, of course, that with the ram or chip, it's it sort of it's beside the field before you harvest it. It's in the field and you can spread it. Our pile of wood chip in the yard 
quite right. More than half of it is little in the eye unknown conifer uh, with a smaller proportion of um, hardwood in it. So it really it's an unknown quantity. And then of course if you're going to compost that, you've got the cost of even just storing it or turning it or whatever. Whereas the the ramiel chip, um, what we did in the uh, trials, and simply harvest it in the field, pile it in the field, spread it in the field, so it didn't go anywhere. So it was much more economic from from that point of view. I mean, I don't, I can't, I can't speak on the technical benefits of this or that, but the, in in terms of the practicalities of it, um, you know, from the hedgerow to the field the hedge is in, that's a short route. And ultimately, if you know, if it's going to work in a farming situation, it has to be practical. And if you can make it easier and cheaper to use it, then that's that's obviously you know a benefit. But Sally or Christine, have you got anything sort of from the science side that you think would indicate one or the other, Ramiel or, or composted? Um, I would say probably both, because um, I think they probably have slightly different actions, um, but. Uh, uh, one need a little bit more more research, surprisingly enough, to back that up. But I do think that they're not directly comparable, but maybe have slightly different actions on the soil. Right. Yeah, I think I, I think I would, I would agree. It depends what you want. Yeah. yeah. But it depends what you what you well, obviously it depends what you've got, but it also slightly depends what your aim is, and probably what kind of fertility status your soil is before you apply it. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean it sort of highlights in a way how little research has been done with Romeo Woodchip, doesn't it? That you know there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, so there was a question here. Uh, we got a lot of questions coming in. So if you don't, if I don't get to yours, I do apologise, but it shows there's a lot of interest. Um, so Richard Noonan asks, I was under the assumption that Romeo Woodchip wood is incorporated into the top two inches of the soil with a mulch layer of 3.5 centimeters in cold temperate and 7.5 centimeters in warm temperate. Are people here incorporating each year or just adding more material to the surface? Um, so, I mean, Eric, you were incorporating, I think, weren't you? Um, Robert, are you? In yes, uh, yeah. we did during the trials, which is my only experience of this, uh, we did uh, incorporate it by uh, cultivating to establish a crop immediately after the uh, chip was spread. So it was uh, incorporated in uh, in a min-till uh, way in the field. So what, so what depth were you incorporating it there? Oh, I don't know, 75 mil? Yeah. And Tolly, you're just spreading it on the surface, aren't you? Yeah, we're, we're following what happens in a natural forest system where material is deposited on the surface and then the soil does the rest. Um, I mean, the, the question you had there, I think the figure was 335 millimetres deep, which is actually a phenomenal amount. I mean, to try and get that amount onto large area, it would be really, really difficult because we're talking 350 cubic metres per hectare. You know, this is nearly 200 tonnes. Um, you know, these amounts are really not achievable in, in agricultural situations. Yeah. Right. There's also, so this is again, it's specific, but I think it illustrates that kind of wider point that Christine was making right at the start about pH. Um, so Lorenzo Costa from Italy asks, uh, he's in Tuscany, he's got a pH of 8.1. The calcium's very high. Uh, but would you suggest incorporating completed wood chips? We apply Korean natural farming IMO4, Indigenous Microorganisms, <laughs> amendments to our wood chips. So I guess how much influence does the wood chip have on pH is, is probably the, the underlying question. Christine, do you want to start that one? I guess the pH of the material to an extent and the, perhaps more importantly, the pH of what washes through the material will depend on the tree species. If, I don't know if anybody's ever just taken a handful of soil from underneath a coniferous tree as opposed to a deciduous tree. If you're ever in a woodland with those two types of trees, go and dig, go and grab a handful of soil from each and you see in them completely different things. You see in them completely different structures. 
and as water washes through coniferous material and pine needles and stuff, it'll be quite acidic. If it comes from a more deciduous tree, it'll be it'll it'll be, it'll be a higher pH. So again, it depends what you're adding to it and how different the, the pH of the material is from the pH of your soil as to what the impact would be. <laughs> Sorry, my answer to everything's it depends, you can tell. <laughs> And you would, were you tracking pH, Sally, in the WUFS trial? Uh, yes, we were. Um, I'd pretty much agree with Christine there. It's not a given thing that the, the wood chip will raise the pH. We saw a trend in, in particularly at Tollies, actually, to um, not raise, lower the pH, to lower pH it, with the ramiel, but also with the compost, which was made from uh, wood chip as well. But yeah, it's not, that wasn't seen in all the trials. And I think it does depend on your input material. Um, compost can have a, a sort of um, neutralising impact, can't it, raising the pH, but I don't think that's a given as well. And Eric, I know you were tracking organic matter. Did you look at the pH as well? I can't remember now whether you mentioned that. Um, yeah, I didn't mention it. It, it. Our pH now is about 6.2 or something, and when I did it originally, it was it was a little bit lower, so I think it actually raised the pH a little bit, but into a band that I it was beneficial. So. But I yeah. can't say it was directly from the wood chip, so I didn't track it that closely. Yeah. Um, and in, I guess sort of moving on from, you know, what we measure and what we don't, there's a question around, um, so from William White, has the carbon sequestration capacity been assessed? Can the carbon sequestration capacity be enhanced by adding another ingredient such as rock dust? And do you know of any work being done on this? So, I mean, Eric, you obviously did see that increase initially in organic matter. Yeah, we saw a big increase, you know, when we put a lot of wood chips in. So, yeah, that was, but. Yeah. And I guess what would be interesting will be to see how much of that stays uh, or whether it's a, you know, it's a temporary from that sort of big injection. And it'd be interesting right. certainly to see your results in a week or so when they come out. Yeah, I don't know if it, yeah, the sequestration, I don't know, because we're just taking piles of carbon and putting them into the soil where they degrade faster. So I don't know what the overall life cycle of the carbon, I don't know if that's really helpful or not, but it's maybe if it makes, you know, humus or whatever in the soil, that might be beneficial, but I'm not sure. And in terms of that, you know, Tolly, I know that you've said since you started using the wood chip, not just the Ramiel wood chip, but the wood chip, you've noticed a uh, a sort of boost to your soil health. I know it's obviously not exactly related to carbon sequestration, but there's a, you know, there's a correlation there, isn't there? Yes, I think there is. I mean, we have seen a very slight increase in carbon content in our soil. We've been looking at it now for 33 years. I mean, there's a lot of rubbish talked about increasing carbon content. You can only increase carbon content in arable situations incredibly slowly. We, we never see large increases. You may increase organic matter, but not carbon, not long-term carbon. I think the benefit we've seen is, is not just because we've raised the carbon content by sort of 0.3% or whatever in 30 years. It's more about um, the soil is so much more healthy in terms of microbes and bacteria. I mean, earthworms, um, I don't think Sally um, quite gave the full picture of our earthworms. I can't help but keep bragging about it, but we have we have 13 million per hectare. I mean, they alone are adding a huge amount of benefit to the soil. So it's not just about increasing carbon, it's about increasing the soil's ability to, to look after itself and to find its own nutrients. You know, our P&K levels have gone up very slowly in 33 years, but they haven't gone up dramatically. But our crops are hugely far healthier and far more abundant than they were when we started. So it has it has made a big difference. I think since we've been using wood chip in the last 10 years, we have seen a real a real change. I mean, before that, we were just about sort of holding our own, whereas now we've seen some real benefits from it. And Robert, have you have you had any <clears throat> sort of thoughts about how, whether you're increasing the you know organic matter or increasing carbon on your fields, or is it really too short a time to tell? I think as, in terms of what the wood chip has achieved, it's uh, you know it was a really small scale short term trial. Uh, certainly, the green waste compost uh, is improving the organic matter, uh, you know slowly but surely, um, and you know 15 years of 
keep going and uh, the tractor drivers are using less diesel, for example. Yeah, so that sort of practical demonstration in a way of the benefits of, of adding that material. Yeah, that's a very really good point um, about using less diesel. We've, we've noticed this as well, and you can almost see it on the gauge. I mean, the amount of cultivations we don't have to do now in order to get soil ready, um, I mean, that's been a huge change, and I think it, it tells you a lot about the condition of the soil when you can get away with far less cultivation to achieve the desired effect. So you're almost heading towards a no-dig system. I wouldn't like to go that far, Ben. We, we do do <laughs> no-dig. Everyone thinks I'm anti-no-dig. I'm not. Uh, we have no-dig in the tunnels. To do no-dig in a 15-acre in a, in a field, um, we cannot afford the luxury of that sort of operation. I guess, you know, it, do, do you think that over time, actually, the judicious use of wood chip might get you close to something like that on field scale? Closer, yeah, but I mean, we're always going to have to have some tillage. I mean, how are you going to get potatoes in and out without tillage? It's impossible. You know, we have to have tillage in order to get crops in and out, um, unless we resort to, you know, incredibly high levels of human labour, which we don't have at the price that we would like to have it for if we want to operate a system like that. It can be done, you know, mil, min till or no till works in, in arable system, primarily because they've got Roundup. Um, you know, without Roundup, no till is very difficult, particularly in vegetable growing systems. I mean, you know, we're experimenting with crimping green manures and, and planting direct into that. This takes very specialised equipment, which on our scale is difficult to justify. On a very, very large scale, it could be done. In fact, you know, on the bigger scale, you have a better chance of doing no till than you have on a medium scale, which is where we are. And Eric, do you have, you know, are you aiming to till less? What's your sort of long-term strategy, I guess, in terms of your, your management system? Well, that's an interesting question that we, people on our farm still talk about today and, and discuss. Um, when we first started, I wanted to do no-till and visited some small market farms in California, like Singing Frogs Farms was one I visited twice that do no-till, you know, just like a three-acre farm, manual labor. Um, they just do CSAs and 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 are able to do it, but they do it all year round, so the the weeds are kept in control. They really have to suppress all the weeds. And I didn't. It came down to weeds, actually. I didn't want to. I didn't want to go all year. And where I am, I really couldn't because of the sunlight issues. I couldn't do it all year, and so I just let the weeds grow over the winter time. And then, I, so I do try to do a, just a one till. And in the greenhouse, we want to also then do no till in. And switching to no-till in the greenhouse because there we can control the, the weeds all year round. I mean, really, just yeah, for us it just came down to weed weed control and weed management because we use the weeds for um, fertility in in the winter time as a way to like a green cover crop. I think the point Eric made there is a really important one. Weeds have a real value to play. A lot of these very intensive no-dig systems are dependent on very very large applications of either manure or wood chip or compost or something. Right. None of which is actually sustainable in the long term because you have to access it from somewhere. And also we're seeing some serious problems here in the UK on land which has had very high inputs of organic matter. And we're getting to a situation where we have got serious, what I call soil obesity, where you have very high levels of phosphate and potash, which is locking up micronutrients. We've got organic matter levels going up to, in, in some cases, beyond 10%, which people often think is really cool. It's not. On most soil types, 10% organic matter, you're moving towards a system which is slowing down and becoming quite inert. So to allow the use of compost in any form from any source in that sort of degree of excessive input in most situations is not sustainable in any sense of the word. And Robert, I mean, obviously you wouldn't ever get to that sort of uh, situation on your arable land, but uh, you know, you, you mentioned obviously sort of decreased diesel use, but has it got to the point where you would, you know, you might consider changing your system and, and you know, tilling, you know, less often or, you know, how, how far has it changed your thinking in terms of, of how you produce the crops? Well, the, the reference to less diesel was actually about the increased workability of the soil rather than specifically reducing the number of um, activities in the field. Um, so it's, it's the workability of the soil that the benefit was there. In terms of um, going to no-till, um, you know, we're pretty much in the hands of our contractor 
there who's um, at the moment on uh, Mintil uh, and we run with him because we've got a relationship with uh, a neighbouring farmer who does all the uh, cultural activities for us um, and we're, we're in his hands really I mean we're you know sort of five percent of what he does so uh, it depends what he comes up with next um, so it, it's very much there in terms of the um, soil obesity that um, Ian was talking about there um, it, you know it's on the horizon we could see that uh, emerging as an issue in in the fullness of time potentially uh, you know everything's under control so far but whether we can you know in perpetuity keep putting on 80 to 100 tons of compost every year um, yeah maybe not and uh, that's you know well, we might have to get marketing it to the neighbors or something um, but it, it's not something we, we're overlooking and it's not something we're complacent about yeah really interesting and, and interesting as well oh. you know that for a lot of farmers you know actually that relationship with contractors or, or people sort of outside of your immediate sphere of control is important uh, Christine sorry were you uh, wanted to make a point yeah, just, just on that one, that, that climate is a big influence here um, because obviously organic matter degrades faster the warmer it is. If it's warm and wet, it degrades faster. Um, if I go out into you know any field around Aberdeen in the north of Scotland, I'd be very happy at 10% organic matter in soil. That's where you know m many of the sort of natural pastures would be 12%. Uh, there is a lot of arable land and eight to ten percent here, but that's a perfectly natural situation because of the controls of climate and soil type. It's, it's to do with uh, the soil textures, the amount of organic matter they can hold, and also to do with, with the temperature. So an equilibrium here could well be that. But as we go as we go forward with, with a change in climate, I think we also need to take into account actually the impact that that's going to have on organic matter decomposition and you know in, in the situations Tolly's talking about where you perhaps have an excess of organic matter raise the temperature there and you start to lose stuff you start to lose soluble carbon into water you start to get you know potentially a pollution issue so we do have to I think think very much in terms of context specific uh, geographically specific and, and the relationship with climate when we talk about these things yeah interesting so uh there's a question uh sort of getting down to sort of practical engineering questions here uh what uh, this is andes bark what is the perfect chip size for raymill and how many meters cubed would you use per hectare <coughs> who wants to go with that one well okay well the perfect chip size i mean maybe sunny's a bigger expert than this than I am, but I, I would say sort of 10 to 20 millimeters, 25 maximum would be ideal. It depends a bit on the on the species because they they don't all chip up the same. Um, willow tends to come out quite big, quite long, but it rots quite quickly. It also depends on how well maintained the machine is because if you have a blunt chipper, you get very large large chips. So it depends on a lot of factors. In terms of application rates, I mean we're we're on uh, around 50 to 70 cubic meters per hectare. Um, nobody should be measuring this in tons, by the way. Shouldn't be measuring cubic meters, um, which is actually related to you know on, on the ground is that's about seven or eight millimeters thick. It's a very very small amount. And I think um, somebody was it uh, Robert maybe was talking about you know one chip deep. Um, yeah, we're about one chip deep. You know, if the chip is seven millimeters thick, then yes, it's about one chip deep. It's very small. Amount. This is a situation where less is actually more. I think you can do far more good by timed applications at the right point in the rotation than you can by putting on huge amounts of material, often which gets wasted. Thanks, Tolly. Any other thoughts on chip size um, or? Yeah, I wouldn't. I, the chip size, I guess, um, yeah, with Tolly, it depends on the chipper and some, particularly some of the sort of like smaller branch wood will give you quite long thin chips but they're mainly bark which decomposes quite well so I'm not sure there is an ideal chip size I would say smaller if it's more heartwood but if it, if it going more towards bark it doesn't matter as much the the um, application rates was something we we wrestled with a bit we've got all sorts of application rates in the trials and I've also looked at literature um, 
and there's application rates again vary quite considerably in, in other trials that, that have been um, carried out. Um, but one thing I've found in the literature is that people have used quite high application rates initially for degraded soil. So they've put on quite a high application rate of ramia wood chip to start off with to sort of kickstart soil biology and soil ac ac biological activity. Um, and then followed up with quite low, sort of 10 to 20 um, cubic meters after that. Um, but in the trials that we did, we, we didn't see a huge amount of difference between the different application rates, to be honest. And Eric, you've played around with different uh, different rates. Have you sort of come up with an optimum for your soil? Um, well, just you know, qualitatively, you know, the thin the thin seems to do just as well as the thick, you know, in terms of harvest yields, and the plants seem to be just as vibrant, you know, with a little bit of addition of fertilizer and compost. And you know, for the size of the wood chips, you know, well, I do about we ask our tree guy, you know, to, to cut them smaller, we, they're about one inch, sorry, I don't know what that is in millimeters um, wide, and that seems to be a, a nice size to, mostly for handling. I did put a row of really large wood chips in to see what would happen, and it's just, I mean, it was, the row was fine, but it's just cumbersome to weed and to transplant when you have large wood chips in the soil. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple of questions around specific species um, so obviously there was uh, Eric's trial with the eucalyptus um, and the uh, willow that we mentioned in the film which actually came out of one of the innovative farmers trials looking at using willow wood chip uh, to stimulate an immune response against apple scab um, but uh, one of the questions or whether there are other single species wood chips that you might use for a particular person or a particular purpose or uh, you know any other known interactions between uh, a particular wood chip species and a plant or or uh, potentially there was an animal question as well I think anyone got any thoughts on that I mean I'll make a quick comment we just kind of use what we get but we have noticed that we have a lot of red alders on our farm and that's a nitrogen fixing tree and it de decomposes really fast and so in some ways if you want something that's really fast decomposing you could i know the red alders do that and i think also birch trees also decompose really fast too but it's just so there was a specific question about red alder in fact uh where is it here we go yeah so uh nick segner from uh olympic mountains near seattle uh, mostly conifers, one species we do use is red alder, which has a CN ratio of 130 to 1. Though, and although this isn't very it's from the whole of the large tree, the granular uh, sawdust, he puts in inverted commas, uh, not a powder, is freely available in huge quantities. How would you design a trial on using this product as an amendment? And actually that reflects another question about the, you know, what's the best way to compost or, or you know, the, the most successful, if you're going to compost ramial wood chip or other wood chip, what's the best best way to do it, if there is a best way? Was that sawdust? Did you say sawdust, Ben? Because sawdust is a completely different material. Well, he's called it sawdust, but sawdust in inverted commas. Uh, so, Nick, I don't know if you want to sort of put another comment in to explain, but I, I imagine it's a kind of, it's, a, it's the whole tree that's being, chopped up so I'm guessing some of it is small but I don't think I don't think it means just sawdust as in the offcuts from a you know woodworking operation okay because sawdust is a really difficult product to deal with even if it's green it's still very difficult because it packs down too tightly in terms of the composting process um it's, it's relatively simple you just row it up into a windrow and you know we go four meters wide two meters high and turn it as and when it needs it in our cases every every three months um the drier the climate the longer it may take i mean we find it's much better in the winter uh, we get a most of our composting process happens between october and, and, and april we don't get much in the summer in fact it it often almost stops in the summer so um climate will, will vary a lot it will make a big difference to how fast you can compost but it, i would always prefer to have more than one species for composting i think this is the beauty of composting you can chuck just about anything in and, and get away with it whereas for ramio you really only want specific species interesting and rob obviously you've got masses of experience of managing wood chip and composting <laughs> what's your recommendation well i mean we, we, we make our compost in about six weeks um 
so it's a fairly intensive process where we're in um, uh, ventilated piles to begin with and then we have windrows which we turn uh, on about a seven to ten day cycle uh, because space is the big issue for us and you've just never got enough space so we have to get the composting process done as quickly as we can uh, before we ship it out to the fields where it will be spread later on um, and you know it, it, it's the commercial realities clashing with the um, scientific perfection <laughs> which is the reality for most farmers I think Eric, you were saying you, you effectively pile it up, do you, and then just choose the one that's most rotted down to spread, which sounds like a nice, simple farming solution to me. Yeah, well, we've got a nice unused field that we can do that on. So, yeah, that's, and the guy's happy to dump on our dump on the field. So. Yeah, but it is interesting because I, I certainly, researching the book I'm doing, is I've noticed the some of the bioreactor information that's coming out does seem to show a much higher diversity of microorganisms than less managed compost potentially uh, and sort of being able to do it in certain ways might give you a potentially a better product but I guess ultimately if you spent so much time and effort getting that better product you know is it worth it when you when you're trying to run a commercial business or actually is 80 percent good enough and you're still you're still getting a lot of that benefit we're obliged to um, make the compost to pass 100 standard so um, that's part of our environmental permit to be allowed to do it at all so we are there are checks and balances on, on the quality of what's coming out of the other end of our system and uh, because we're in, and conversely we, we're not past 100 registered um, so all of our compost is still classified as a waste product so we have to get deployments for every 50 hectares that we're spreading to um, and the environment agency charges us 1700 quid every time so why have you not why are you not past 100 registered what's the decision there because you could uh, be presumably yeah it, it's a it's a historic decision when we were a bit smaller it, the economics were uh, against it, it was cheaper to go for deployments than it was to um, bear the cost of past 100 regulation. And by not being past 100, we've got a bit more latitude in terms of what we do. Um, because, for example, if we get a, um, a batch of compost that fails past 100 tests because of stones, um, basically the agronomist says to the environment agency, so what? And then we can spread it. So yeah it's sort of it, it, to some extent it's imposing unnecessary disciplines on us because small stones you know a small number of small stones in the sample is enough to make a fail for past 100 but it makes no difference at all to what's going on in the field yeah and for those of you not in the uk the past 100 is a is a sort of national standard for the composting process um so on the composting note there's a couple of questions around disease um, and the, the risk of disease and certainly it's something uh, on the farm we're doing uh, we're using a lot of waste uh, wood chip from uh, tree surgeons and you know inevitably a lot of tree surgeons are taking out diseased trees or dying trees there's likely to be a higher uh, proportion of diseased wood than if you were you know managing your own coppice or your own hedge um, and certainly the approach I've taken is, you know, if I'm composting it and turning it and spreading it out around trees of potentially a different species, the risk is pretty low. But does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we monitor the temperature, obviously, of the compost piles all the time. And um, I think it's fairly well accepted that if we're getting a temperature of 55 centigrade or a little more, um, then the uh, pathogens making it to the field are very, very few. So yeah, so doing doing a sort of a professional composting job will will certainly eliminate most of that risk. I guess for for those that are doing it in a, a less controlled way, you know, I guess you know Eric and Ian, uh, Tolly, you know, you are you worried about that risk, or have you seen any any problems from using the material? No, I'm not worried about it. There's, there's other things on the farm that I prefer to worry about. <laughs> um, my feeling is that disease 
it's not a problem as, as Robert said within composting because temperatures we're getting up you know quite high temperatures but with rammer chip we don't, there is a kind of potential problem perhaps but the amount we're putting on is is going to be processed by soil bacteria and soil microorganisms anyway and I think any disease that's there is going to be eaten up by some other antagonistic organism so you know the ground is full of fungi bacteria and disease I mean that's what we're cultivating you know you could call a lot of these fungi and bacteria are diseases in the soil anyway um, so I don't really think it's a problem unless, say, you know, you were comp you were using, say, ramuel chipped apple wood onto apple trees, and I think that could cause some problems. So I don't see it's a problem with vegetable production because the diseases are not transmissible. If it's for tree production, then yes, there is a possible problem there, and I think people perhaps would need to be cautious. Eric, have you got any? Uh... Yeah, so I don't I don't worry about it at all. And I did see in the heavy wood chip row um, this last year, I got a lot of um, club root rot, club root in the broccoli. But I think that was just because I was planting in almost wood chips and it was there were a lot of air pockets when I, you know, went back and replanted and put in soil and packed it in. That wasn't a problem. Yeah. Um, so there's a question from Tim Krieger. In permanent bed veg systems, uh, compost in the beds, wood chips in the pathways. Does it make sense to move the aged wood chips from the pathways to the beds? Yeah, we are doing exactly that. Um, in tunnels, we're not applying compost to the beds at all. We're only putting um, ramble chip wood or raw wood chip on the pathways, leaving it for couple of years and once it's decomposed we kind of scrape off what's left which isn't very much put it on the bed um most of it actually disappears through the action of earthworm so we kind of think it gets into the bed through that route anyway so yes it, it does work very well it's very low input um and it keeps the path really clean and tidy yeah and eric have you done have you used wood chip at all on the paths or are you just putting it on the beds in your system um I just put it on the beds. I'd like to do it on the pathways. In the greenhouse, we do it on the pathways, though, and do just that. And just once the compost, we'll rake it back up. But in, in the field, though, that just seemed like, yeah, you know, we, yeah, we we till everything, so the pathways go away every year. So, yeah. Um, and there was a comment which has now disappeared about uh, about how the wood chip actually sort of um, it. The, the fungi in the wood chip ends up suppressing the the pathogen fungi sometimes in, in diseases and I've now lost uh, that comment but that's in that might have come through in the answer to everyone uh, I'm not aware that any research work has been done on this element of wood chip at all I don't know Sally or anybody else Christine know of any work that's been done on this I don't know of any work but I was just thinking about Eric and his eucalyptus, in that what you might be seeing is a biofumigant effect. In that, you know, we, we know that if you, for instance, put mustard, you know, plowing mustard mustards into soil that are, you know, really releasing chemicals and, and being used in things like strawberry systems to control mycelium wilt. And lavender shows the same impact. So it seems likely that eucalyptus is exuding something. Uh, that, that is that is killing soil biology. Now you don't necessarily want to kill soil biology, but there may be situations where actually that biofumigant disease control element is actually a positive. I think there was there was a small amount of evidence from the Woofs trials that the Ramia wood chip may have had a positive impact on some of the plant diseases as well. For example, on on the um, downy mildew on the brassicas at Tollies, we saw less incidence of that in the, in the Ramia wood chip plots. Interesting. Yeah. And I have I have read some studies showing that some of those allopathy effects actually can, you know, stop weeds germinating. So, you know, potentially using wood chip as a mulch actually, you know, not not only smothers out weeds, but potentially also fresh wood chip can stop them germinating. I mentioned um, that too. we did use the eucalyptus wood chip one year just on a Swiss chart and yeah, it suppressed the, the weeds, which just were very nice. Although once fall came up though, and the rain started, then the slug population increased dramatically and kind of, you know, was, that was a real problem using the mulch. 
for us. Yeah. And uh, there was a question also about whether there are any, I mean, apart from possibly the eucalyptus, uh, but, you know, whether there are any species of wood that you just really wouldn't use as a Ramiel wood chip. Um, I, you know, walnut, for instance, is one that's sort of renowned for being, for having exudates. Yeah, this is another interesting one, and this comes up a lot. So many trees contain so many poisons, you know. I mean, it's quite common for trees to have poisons and heavy metals and all sorts of things. I think if you were trying to compost, say, walnut on its own, you could run into some difficulties in the same way you would with um, conifers. But if it's part of a mixed uh, material, I don't actually think this is a problem at all. I mean, we've composted uh, elder, which is full of other nasty things. Um, yeah, we've had walnut, we've composted that, no trouble. Um, you know, the, the softwoods we've composted, but we've got enough other materials. So I think it's unlikely, unless you were using it as a single species compost. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Impossible, Sorry. but unlikely. Possibly you weren't composting and adding it ramiel, um, so just green to the soil, you might need to be a bit more cautious. Yeah, I think you're right there, Sally. That was a possibility. I mean, I wouldn't want to put walnut fresh on the soil, that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the difference between ramiel or composted material, I think, again, which again is a reason possibly for some degree of composting because you can kind of chuck anything in and get away with it. Whereas ramiel, I think we need to be a little bit more careful about what we use in terms of species. Or, or we just need some more research, basically, don't we? Yeah, or we need more research, Sally, so when are you going to do it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there was there, there was a question, I mean, it's sort of related to that composting bit again, which was around, does, uh, do any of the speakers have experience with spraying uh, or effective microorganisms or compost teas on the wood chip pile to accelerate the the composting or do you basically just let nature take its course? Yeah, we just let it happen. I mean, uh, when I first started this process, I was worried because it got very dry and I tried to irrigate it. It's impossible. You cannot irrigate wood chips. It just runs out. Um, I mean, the possibility of some inoculation may be useful, I think, perhaps in the, in the early stages. But once you've got a site and our site is on soil, I think that's quite important because the soil will then take up a whole lot of potential inoculant material, which would go back into the next heap. Um, I think one of the reasons our first trials were slow is because we didn't really have the right fungi and bacteria there. And I think it's partly come on its own accord and it's now infectious on the whole site. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, I was gonna say, we do routinely uh, recirculate all the leachate uh, onto the first stage of the composting process, the um, sanita sanitization stage, um, partly as a means of dealing with the leachate. And then uh, obviously it's a bit helps to get the moisture into the compost, which we need. Um, and then the compost is a vehicle to get the leachate out to the field. So for all sorts of reasons, um, you, you know, the, the Environment Agency want us to work on an impervious service, surface. So um, we have to do something with the leachate and we're not allowed to discharge that. So, you know, it, it's it's just part of the process. Great. Well, thank you all very much. We're sort of getting to the end. Sally, did you have a final slide with some links on it? Oh, I did. Wrap up. I think you did, didn't you? Um, mm -hmm. But while you're finding that, uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers, to Christine, to Sally, to Tolly, to Robert and to Eric. Um, and thanks to Dominic in the background, who's been uh, managing the uh, the questions. And thanks, of course, to Astrid, who's, who organised it all. Um, the uh, it's not coming up the final slide, but um, oh, the not? it's not well, not for me. I don't know if other people can see it. Ah, there we go. There we go. Uh, so I think. Sally, you were going to put all of the findings from the project are going to go onto the agroecology website. Yep. Is that right? Yep, that's right. So we've got some three technical guides. Um, two of them are ready. Uh, one of them's up there and one of them will be up there shortly. And then the final one will go up um, afterwards. And then we'll have a final report as well, um, which will be there as well. Great. 
Um, and I know that probably a lot of you might even have found out about this event through our Facebook page, uh, which is the Woodchip for Soil Health. And there is also uh, another one which uh, is not coordinated by us, but is fascinating, which is the Romeo Woodchip Facebook page. So I'm sure a lot of you are already members of both, but we'll be putting links to the uh, trial results onto the Woodchip for Soil Health Facebook page as well, if that's if that's where you're going to look. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thanks for the fantastic number of um, really detailed and fascinating questions. Um, we've recorded this webinar as well, so it will be available um, probably through the Agroecology as well, Sally, I'm guessing, um, once we've done a bit of editing. Uh, so thank you all uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.